2023 will forever go down in history as the year when things happened. Whatever those things were, I couldn't tell you. This was honestly one of the lowest years for me because I told myself I was going to be more productive, finish the projects I had on the back burner for years now. Then when January rolled around, I had to get my wisdom teeth surgically removed. In March, I learned about a bunch of problems I had to sort out. June through August was my worst summer working experience thus far. My family physician retired in October, forcing me to find a new one, and just to top it all off, after five years of avoiding it, I contracted the big C-19 not a week before Christmas. So far 2024 hasn't been too kind to me either, so you'll have to excuse me if my enthusiasm sounds fake at times because I am tired and overwhelmed. <laughs> I can count maybe two times I was genuinely happy this year, and that was when I celebrated 10 years of making content on this channel because it was legitimately fun to look back on what I learned to make something closer to my style now. The other was a Hololive concert. So for the first time since the pandemic, I was relying on video games as an escape from reality. I realize that's a really heavy-handed way to start a video like this, but if there's anything I pride myself over, it's my honesty. I'd much rather be open about my feelings instead of faking it and having it all seep through, leaving people to speculate. But enough about me, because last I checked, this was a channel where I talk about the things I love. And big surprise, I love video games. So allow me to talk about what I played last year. This time I wanted to start with where I left off last year. The five backlog games I challenged myself to finish before 2023 came to an end. I chose five games since I have a full-time job now that sort of impedes on my ability to play games when I want to, but I didn't expect it to take so long that the first game I checked off would be in early June. And the sad thing? Only took me three hours to finish. <laughs> There's not a whole lot to say about Sin and Punishment, surprisingly. I don't remember who specifically told me or where I might have heard it from, but I remember somebody telling me that I should play this game because of its intense gameplay and incredible story. And they got the intense gameplay part right, but this is far from what I consider an incredible story. Who's this kid? Why are they talking to Eyes in the Sky? Why is one of my allies a zombie girl? What am I playing here, Kingdom Hearts? Oh god, it's trying to become Evangelion now. Let me meet the director who let their kid into the recording booth for this character. Thinking of revenge? Hachu is gone. Think of the living, like me. I just want to talk. You're about to kill me! And that was just some of the many thoughts going through my head as I played Sin and Punishment. Hope there wasn't too much I had to pay attention to for the sequel, because as hard as I tried, I didn't retain any information from my first playthrough. I remember mutants start taking over the Earth, and, uh, no, that's it, actually. What I do remember, however, is how much fun the gameplay is. Running around, shooting everything in sight, and whipping out your sword to deflect shots and get up in your enemy's face while soloing an entire enemy fleet. I'd call it mindless fun, but there's so much sensory overload going on that you should probably focus on the action if you want to survive. I ended up using the Wii U gamepad as my controller of choice, and while I had to do a lot of button reconfiguration, the ultimate result was a very comfy experience. But there are some bizarre decisions that were made here, like two-player mode, where one player controls characters' movement and the second controls the crosshairs? Like, what? <laughs> okay, that's one way to do it, I guess. Or how about frame skipping mode, which is unlocked after beating hard mode? Actually, what does frame skipping do exactly? Looking it up real quick. Oh my god! Once again, I wish I had more to say about this game, but it really is just as simple as you like to blow shit up, then play Sin and Punishment. I honestly had no idea I had two games developed by Treasure on this list when I made it last year. Up until I played Sin and Punishment, I thought that was a Nintendo-developed game. Not this one, though. I was well aware of what Gunstar Heroes was all about since I watched several playthroughs of it on YouTube and Twitch over the years. 
And I am so glad I finally got around to experiencing this because Gunstar Heroes was so much fun to play through. Despite this only being a 2D game, when I compare this to Sin and Punishment, I can't even begin to comprehend how this would have run on an original Sega console because it goes from 0 to 100 and even 110 real fast. Must be all that blast processing people are always telling me about. I got together with my brother to play for on expert mode and I was really proud of how far we were able to get. Until I continued to finish the game myself and learned that we weren't even halfway done and the final stretch does not pull any punches. In hindsight, we probably should have started on easier difficulty to learn the controls and give ourselves more leeway to study the boss patterns, but I was already aware that you had to play on Expert to experience the full game, and I guess I thought we could take it. Gunstar Heroes is a running gun game where you pick a weapon module at the start of the game and then you combine them with other modules found throughout the levels for a variety of different weapons, ranging from machine guns to remote controlled fireballs and even just a straight up lightsaber. And they're all very well balanced, so part of the fun is figuring out which weapon combo will best suit the next challenge. Usually a boss fight, which are all very challenging and quite, uh, unique. If you can get a co-op partner together for this game, well, of course I'm going to recommend that. But Gunstar Heroes has such a solid single-player experience that you can easily have fun both ways. If you've never played Gunstar Heroes before, I highly recommend you go check it out. It's available on Steam for super cheap and can easily be played with a friend through Steam's remote play system. Well, I mean, that is assuming you have decent internet connection, that is. Metroid Dread As someone who prefers the 2D games over the 3D FPS ones, this was my Metroid Prime 4. I was so hyped when I saw that original announcement. However, I decided to give it some time before I played it. I wanted that hype to pass so that I could judge the game on a fair and honest mindset. Well, I have some thoughts. Unfortunately, I need to discuss what most people will consider spoilers, so skip here if you haven't played Metro Dread for yourself yet. Alright, I guess let's get my pettiest complaint out of the way first. The AI from Metroid Fusion is back, and he's got this weird garbling effect over his voice that makes it really hard to understand him. Like, yeah, sure, I can read the text, but for slow readers or dyslexics like me, that can really slow down the pace. Next, I need to talk about the Emmys, because these were probably the biggest selling point of the game, and they left me... Massively disappointed. I love the idea of the Emmys. They're these flexible robots that can instantly kill you and even tower over the canonically six foot free Samus. On paper, these should be something that fill me with dread, considering my genuine fear of death claws from Fallout. <laughs> but in practice, all they did was frustrate me, because once I realized that the only consequence for getting caught by an Emmy was a simple, small setback, any potential for fear was just thrown out the window. I don't think it helped that there were so many of these goddamn things as well. After a while, I just started running through the Emmy rooms recklessly, because I thought it was faster to do that and get caught when compared to studying the Emmy's movements, standing still when it's in range of hearing, and then getting caught because it bumped into me while I was cloaked. So I guess they did fill me with dread, just not the kind that they were aiming for. Next, okay, this is going to sound incredibly petty to some of you, but controls are so important to me. Remember when Metroid Other M came out and one of the biggest critiques of the game was the fact that it was a 3D game with movement restricted to the D-pad? Well, this is a similar situation, because Metroid Dread is a 2D game where you move with the analog stick. Now, in theory, this should allow for more freedom of movement, but what people fail to realize is that opening a 2D game to more directions leads to more errors. There are so many times where I tried to crouch down for better aim or to ready a shine spark, only for Samus to run off a cliff because the game didn't see that as a downward movement. Maybe you didn't encounter this problem, but I did, and it ruined my overall experience. 
And before anyone asks, no, it was not Joy-Con Drift. Lastly, it feels like the game is focusing far too hard on keeping the momentum going outside of Emmy sections. When I think back on my playthrough of Dread compared to when I played Bloodstained Ritual of the Night in 2019, there are much less Eureka moments where I had to think back on past areas to test my new abilities in because they usually weren't too far in Dread, causing me to not stop and appreciate the environment as much because there was usually some condensed action for me to focus on at all times. It really does pain me to speak so negatively about what was supposed to be, and technically still is, the next big Metroid game. People love this game, and for good reason. It has some of my favorite environments I've seen in the series, Samus is super sharp and nimble when the controls are working properly, and the boss fights, oh my god, I don't remember the last time I was this excited fighting bosses in a Metroid game. Like the final boss, I, I mean, I'm keeping it vague because I don't want to go full spoiler mode, but like when I had to learn from my mistakes and was forced to realize that I can't just space jump my way out of all my problems, that was fun, I really liked that. Any game devs out there, more like that please. I like a cinematic climax as much as the next guy, but I like to get my butt kicked sometimes too. I genuinely cannot remember the last time I had conflicting emotions for a game as I did here because I like Metroid Dread. I just, I just wish I could have liked it more than I did. Go play Metroid Dread for yourself if you haven't already, because there's clearly something here for the fans. I just wish I could see it. Castlevania Rondo of Blood. What the hell is a Rondo anyways? Oh. As a Castlevania fan, Rondo of Blood was a game that had been on my radar for quite some time now, as it's considered by many to be one of the best. I figured it was finally time to play it for myself after Castlevania Nocturne was announced. <sighs> Man, can I talk about that real quick? Because I was so disappointed, dude. Like, come on, you made an anime adaptation of a Castlevania game that had a proper story? You could totally adapt that to TV, and yet you ditched all that for some French Revolution crap? Now, I'm an old-school Castlevania fan, so I felt right at home here. Richter's got that classic Belmont stiffness that makes you cautious of each move you make, but they did make some changes that I kind of like. Richter can do a backflip to help dodge enemies, and sometimes falling down a pit just takes you to an alternate path, so you can continue your playthrough however you'd like. This game also introduced the Item Crash, a technique that unleashes a powerful attack depending on the sub-weapon you're holding. But, uh, I'll be honest, I rarely used this skill. Maybe it was because of my experience with past Castlevania games, but I just found it easier to study the enemy's attack patterns and use the sub-weapons by themselves so I could use them more often. We also got Maria Renard, who becomes a playable character once you rescue her from Dracula's prison. She can attack while moving, slide, double jump, and is just an overall quick little bugger. For as much fun as it was to play as Maria, I mostly sticked with Richter because it felt too easy to just blaze through the levels with her. Especially after I learned of her frickin' Jojo stance by accident, Jesus Maria, what can't you do? So after finally finishing Rondo of Blood for myself, can I call this the best Castlevania game? I... honestly don't know. I think I need to play it more before I can give a concrete answer. I mean, Castlevania 3 has been my gold standard for the 2D Castlevanias for years now, so... Maybe I just need to warm up to Rondo of Blood a bit more. That said, if you like the old Castlevania games, I definitely recommend giving Rondo of Blood a try. Just don't try to use an item crash with a key. Hey, sorry about the background noise, because funny thing, I just finished editing this video when I realized that I never even mentioned the blog I wrote while I was playing the game. So, if you want to read my raw thoughts on the game in a very old-school Let's Play text style, then I'll have a link for my co-host page in the video description. Okay, back to the original video. Gotta love Fallout. 
So Fallout 2 is basically more of the OG Fallout. Thought the world in Fallout was too big? Too bad, have more of it. There's more weapons, more perks, more companions, hell they even got rid of the time limit, meaning there's even more time to explore the wasteland to your heart's content. I was originally concerned by how little the gameplay had changed, but those concerns were shortly lived because the original Fallout got a lot correct from the start, so there never really was a need for a complete overhaul. They did add some quality of life improvements though. Like a significant lack of settlements that will attack if you have a weapon equipped so you spend so much less time in the inventory menu. As well as actually being able to trade with your companions, like seriously why wasn't this in the first game? I don't gotta sneak bottles of Nuka-Cola into my companion's pants anymore. <laughs> Sounds good. When I hear people say the infamous phrase of you can go anywhere and do whatever you want when talking about open world sandbox games, I think this might be what people are thinking of. No, you can't actually do whatever you want, but you are given a lot of freedom in this game. Go wherever you want, kill whoever you want, raiders, innocents, quest givers, children. The only thing stopping you is your own moral code. Or maybe your own stupidity, because just like the other Fallout games, you can make a low intelligence build, a high intelligence build, a gun toting cowgirl, a tribal bruiser, a prostitute. Oh, whoops, did I say that last one out loud? Look, I don't mind some 18 plus content sometimes, and it's not unusual to find sexual content in Fallout, but it got a bit too much for me when I got to New Reno. <laughs> Like, you can have a one-night stand with a mob boss's daughter, and then turn around and bang her mother without a rubber. Or become an adult film star, and uh, those are the tamer examples. Now, I actually have a pretty humorous story that involves a late-game side quest, so skip here if you feel that could spoil your experience. So there's a side quest where you have to help a guy get his spleen back because he lost it in a bet. But when I met the requirements to finish the quest, I couldn't find the guy to complete it. At first I thought it was a glitch because, well, it's Fallout, even the old games got friendly with the bugs. But then I told my co-worker about this, and he told me, uh, you took too long, that dude's dead, bro. <laughs> and I couldn't help but laugh hearing that because, like, yeah, of course he's dead, he's been missing his spleen for several days, not even Scorpion could survive that. <laughs> So if you enjoyed the twisted world of Fallout, complete with its dark humor, pop culture references, and its overall unapologetic nature, then... Yeah, you should play Fallout 2. I will warn you though, throughout my playthrough, the game froze during every combat instance. I haven't heard anybody talk about this, but it happened to me, and it kind of ruined my overall experience, which is why I can't call this the best Fallout game like all the old school fans do. Oh wait, there's a shove button to move companions. Oh wait, there's a functioning car that you can repair. Never mind, this is clearly a 10 out of 10 game. So, those were the games I played with the goal of finishing before 2023 came to a close, but there are other games I played throughout the year I want to talk about as well. On New Year's Eve, my brother came over for a movie night, and when we had time to spare, we broke in the new year by playing Mortal Kombat 1 till the clock struck 12. The right path is still open to you. The right path? Or the submissive path? I might have only played this on the final day of the year, but we played so much Mortal Kombat 1 that night that I felt confident enough to talk about it. Besides, it's a fighting game. There's really not a whole lot to talk about in the first place. It all controls well, and combos are satisfying to pull off. It's all I could really ask for from a fighting game. Well actually, I'm going to be expecting a lot more from gaming in general now, because a fresh install has described video on by default, which... Customize your audio mix and more. Speech to text. That's great, we need more accessibility options in video games, and it sucks that a lot of games still don't have the courtesy to have subtitles on when their games start with a cinematic cutscene. The cameo system is one that I'm a bit mixed on, because on one hand, it's a fun mechanic to mix and match fighters. But on the other hand, this means that previous fan-favorite characters are now relegated to combo extenders that just kind of hang out in the background. 
They all have their own fatalities though, which is nice. Speaking of fan favorites, it's really sad to see just how much modern gaming standards have caught up to old MK. Shang Tsung, another fan favorite fighter, has a very big role in the game's story mode, and despite that, he's paid DLC because he was originally a pre order bonus. Your plan to punish me has failed. I wished to reform you, not punish you. Hell, Ermac plays a big role in the story, and he's still not available for download. That ain't cool, bro. There's also the Shrine, which is effectively a loot box system. Now, thankfully, it only unlocks concept art and cosmetics to personalize your fighters, but it still kind of sucks to see. Especially since you can't put real money into it, so why even have it at all? There's even limited time seasonal currency, which lets you buy whatever you want from the seasonal store. So again, why have the loot box system? I guess the takeaway here is I like playing Mortal Kombat 1. I just don't like its business practices. I like playing around with all the different characters, but I don't like how much of them I'm expected to pay for. I like being able to customize my fighter, but I don't like how cosmetic items are in the same randomized pool as concept art. I like the single player invasion mode, but I don't like that it's a live service, meaning that it's gonna go down eventually. For every positive I like, there's a negative I dislike. Like how I can't show any of the amazingly gruesome fatalities without getting this video age restricted. Okay, that last one isn't the game's fault, but... Part of the fun of Mortal Kombat is the over-the-top and, at times, even silly levels of ultraviolence, and I can't show any of that if I still want to be in YouTube's good graces. Ironically, the only fatality I can show you is probably the best one. Flawless victory. Now, as an F Zero fan, F Zero Ninety Nine is something that, in practice, I should be happy about, and I love the game. It's basically the original Super Nintendo game with the absolute chaos of the 3D, N sixty four, and GameCube titles, so I should be happy. But then I stop to think about a few things, and my optimism slowly fades away. And the main killjoy here is the fact that this was made exclusively for Nintendo's online gaming service. Meaning, I can't own a physical copy of it. Meaning that once Nintendo discontinues the game, it's gone forever. Not a matter of if, but a matter of when. And don't pretend they won't do it. They did it to Mario 35. If they're willing to kill off a game from their money-making mascot, they'll do it for a series that hasn't had a new game since, well, this. So as much as I'd like to tell you all to go play F-099 to show support for the series, all I can really say is, go play F-099 while you still have the chance. I'm not proud to say that, but it is the unfortunate truth of our current gaming climate. You know, I may as well call this next part the Dragon Ball Power Hour and emphasize it by saying, Don't stop, don't stop, we're in luck now. Because like I said last year, I missed out on a lot of Dragon Ball games growing up, and this year was my real attempt to play catch up. So, lightning round it is. Dragon Ball Z Budokai still controls surprisingly well, though there isn't much variety in special attacks making fights stale after a while. Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi. You can't transform during fights, I already miss every other Dragon Ball game. Dragon Ball Z Budokai 2. I played the story mode with my brother and it was a lot of fun, but got a bit more than broken once we learned about the heart virus vaccine combo. It's also the only game to have the best fusions in the same game, Tianchun Goku, Super Dragon Ball Heroes World Mission. Why is everything a goddamn card game? Dragon Ball GT Final Bout. Don't stop, don't stop. No. Stop now. Okay, lightning round over. This game is gonna have to get its own segment because, oh my god, I cannot believe what I've been missing out on. 
Dragon Ball Fighters had been out for five years before I finally played it, and it was only because my brother wanted to. Developed by Arc System Works, I knew the game was in good hands, considering their track record of making confident fighting games with fun characters that can all hold their own against each other. I'm not joking, my main in this game is Master Roshi. How many people do you know that can say that about any other Dragon Ball game? And honestly, there's just enough iconic characters from the franchise that I can't really think of any new fighters I want in the roster. Well, except maybe Goku. You'll bring him back, you cowards! And while I'm happy this game gave us Android 21, who's had one of my favorite Dragon Ball designs since... Well, Gogeta Blue, actually. I can't call this a good story. It starts off promising, with Android 21 suppressing everyone's strength so that she can power up and become the strongest in the universe, but they introduce the player character to the story in a way that really doesn't work for me. And while the game claims to have three different story arcs, they're actually three different retellings of the same story, making it both repetitive and somehow forgettable. But everything else is great. There's an arcade mode where you can get your butt kicked, online and local multiplayer if you want to kick your friends' butts, and even Xenoverse-style raid battles where you can team up and kick butt with your friends. But if you're a fan of both Dragon Ball and Arc System Works fighting games, then you should definitely play Dragon Ball Fighters. Oh, uh, real quick though, if you value your time, then for the love of God, do not get this on Xbox One. Uh, I, I know that sounds like an outdated thing to say, considering the Xbox One is pretty obsolete now, but that's the version I originally got, and boy howdy, does it have Sonic 06 levels of load times, and I wish I was exaggerating. Get on PC if you can run it. Another game I ended up playing with my brother was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. Now, confession time. I did not grow up with the OG Ninja Turtles cartoon. But I did grow up with the 2003 version, plus my brother and I put a lot of quarters into that old arcade machine back in the day, so... Yeah, I'd say we're Turtle fans. I also unironically enjoyed the first movie. Shredder's Revenge is a great modernization of the original arcade game. There's a story mode, an arcade mode, a level-up system with special moves... Six players?! I really hope there's footage for this, I don't have that many Joy-Cons. I know that beat-em-ups are considered an outdated game genre by a lot of people these days, but I don't care, this is fun. Get some friends together and play Shredder's Revenge. It'll be a real party, dude. Here's a question for you. Have you ever played Jones in the Fast Lane? Well, for those that don't know, Jones in the Fast Lane is an old MS-DOS program that was basically a virtual board game. The goal is to accumulate the most points by managing your character's wealth, happiness, social status, and education. Welcome to the factory. We'll overwork you, underpay you, and expect you to take it with a smile. I never played Jones in the Fast Lane, but this year I did play No Time to Relax, which is basically a more modern version of the game. Actually, the more I read about it, it seems that they're practically the same game. It's like Jones in the Fast Lane with the serial numbers filed off and replaced with new ones. It's surprisingly addictive and a great time with friends, so you should definitely remote play this one. It's got a really fun art style, too. Aeroporter is one of those games I only bought because it was a 3DS download exclusive and, well, we all know what happened to the eShop. The game was developed by Level 5 Games, so I knew it would at least be a confident product. But in the end, the only reason I even played it was because of my nephew. My nephew doesn't play video games, so it was actually kind of fun to watch him trying to figure out the controls despite lacking the hand-eye coordination for a 3DS, and his impatience for instructions. It starts out simple enough, sort the colored luggage to the corresponding conveyor belt so they can be loaded onto the plane by takeoff time. But then you get VIPs like the President, or emergency response vehicles. Some conveyor belts are dark, making it hard to see colors. 
There's also suspicious packages to deal with. Oh, and you can't just buy fuel. You have to bring it down the conveyor belt. It's such a simple game to control, but you're thrown more and more challenges to keep the experience from going stale. Would I call it good? I don't know. It kept my nephew entertained for 20 minutes. That's really not an easy thing to do. Actually, now that I think about it, I think there was a Pajama Sam game that played in a similar fashion that I put hours into at his age, so... I guess we're not so different. That's right, I'm not just a detective. I'm a time now this was a pleasant surprise when I first heard about it. An officially licensed Hololive game designed by one of their own talents, Amelia Watson. Ame has been one of my favorite VTubers of mine since her debut because of that creative big brain of hers, so... Of course I had to see what kind of game she could cook up. Turns out to be a tie-in game for her first original song, Chiku Taku, a one-to-one -one recreation of the music video in the form of a rhythm game. The rhythm heaven inspiration is apparent right away, the music's super catchy, and both the pixel art and 3D assets are a real treat to the eyes. But those are aspects shared with the music video. Which brings me to my biggest critique. When you're finished with a song in a rhythm game, what's next? Well, you usually go on to the next song, right? But this game is just the one song. So once you've perfected it, what else is there to do that you can't get out of the music video? And try as I may, I could not find a way to download the game, meaning you can only play it on your browser, complete with frame stuttering, which is not ideal for a rhythm game. Though I suppose it is a good time waster if you want to kill roughly four minutes. Plus, it's a nice milestone to show her growth as a singer. Seriously, if you weren't there to experience the growing pains that was Amelia's singing voice, then you have no idea how freaking proud I am of her. Now, the first game I beat in 2023 was the Dragon Quest VII Remake for the 3DS. With the closure of the Wii U and 3DS eShops in late March, this also meant that a majority of DLC would no longer be available to download. And while I thought I was quite thorough in grabbing all that I could, it wasn't until late January when I learned that some games, including Dragon Quest VII, had downloadable story content that could not be downloaded until you finished the game. In reality, I probably could have just watched it somewhere on YouTube, or maybe even modded my 3DS, but... I'm a collector first and a preserver second, so... Looks like it's time to speedrun an 80-hour RPG in the two months I have left. Try as hard as I may, though, I can't remember a single major story beat beyond the first hour of the game. You could argue I don't remember as much since I was in a rush to finish the game, but I'm not entirely convinced that's the case, and here's why. My biggest problem with the original Dragon Quest was its use of old-timey English in all the dialogue, and while Dragon Quest VII doesn't do that as much, it still writes a lot of text in different accents, which is great for world building, not so great for dyslexics like me who already have a hard time reading. I don't think it helped that the main story kept getting pushed farther and farther back for several different time travel stories, making for a rather repetitive narrative structure. Gameplay-wise, man, if this was your first RPG, I can see why you'd think the genre is a repetitive slogfest. So there was this one fight I got stuck with to the point where I had to grind, there was no way around it only to learn the hard way that each area has a level cap for upgrading your classes. If a character passes that level, they still gain experience points, but not class experience points. And since classes are how you learn the majority of your skills in this game, I was stuck for a while. Speaking of skills, there's around 120 usable skills in this game, making your abilities tab quickly fill up with skills that become outclassed in no time. I would also soon learn that stat-increasing items like the Seeds of Strength could potentially hurt my character thanks to the game's weirdly complex stat algorithm. And as if that wasn't enough, there are multiple times in this game where a party member will leave for whatever reason. Sometimes for half the chapter, meaning that by the time you get them back, you have to play catch-up with them because their stats haven't been altered since they left. And before you go crying spoilers, Trust me, the emotional impact of this is important to me quickly dies down when it's repeated so often it's like a workout routine. 
We're trying to save the world, Chad. Your reps can wait, but this is important to me. I haven't played the DLC yet. I needed a break after playing an 80-hour RPG non-stop for four weeks, and considering the fact I wasn't emotionally invested in any of these characters, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. I just realized I don't remember a single character's name in this game. Huh. Professor Layton vs. Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney was another game I had rushed through to download the DLC before it was too late. But this one I had very mixed opinions on going in. I was excited to try another puzzle-filled adventure with the Professor and his favorite apprentice, but despite enjoying what I played of Dual Destinies after a run-in with a few toxic Ace Attorney fans, I had been avoiding the series. Yeah, call me petty all you'd want from your high horse, that's not gonna change anything. My first major concern was how the anime style of Phoenix Wright would clash with the more flat-faced, cartoony look of Professor Layton. I found that while it wasn't too jarring for my eyes, the difference was still there, so it's definitely gonna have differing opinions all around. If we're talking about presentation, yeah, it's all pretty good. Character designs are standout and memorable, background and set pieces are vibrant, the over-the-top sound effects help add to the drama in the courtroom, and voice acting, when present, is good. Well, sadly I wasn't a big fan of Samantha Dakin's performance as Maya Fey, but from what I could find this was her first proper voice acting role, so maybe she was just trying to find her voice. But I think what ultimately pushed me out of the experience was Leighton and Luke of all people playing the straight man of the story. Which isn't out of the ordinary for them, but it feels kind of backwards to have these supposed professional lawyers cracking jokes and acting like bumbling idiots in the middle of a court case. I get that Ace Attorney is known for its comedic moments, and that's probably the joke, but well, I'm sorry to say this doesn't make me want to return to the Ace Attorney series. And I think this game just made me realize a personal problem I have with Ace Attorney. I am so far ahead of the game that I'm presenting evidence too early, leading me to overthinking as I try and figure out why the theoretical smoking gun is seen as irrelevant. And while the story started off strong and got me invested for a while, I was massively disappointed by the ending. I get it, it's Professor Layton, the whole point is that nothing is ever as it seems, but it still left me unsatisfied. If you like Professor Layton or Phoenix Wright, it's not a bad game. In fact, I found the writing was done well in a way that the novelty of it being a crossover didn't die as fast as most crossovers do. But you can do better for Professor Layton, and I imagine that goes for the Ace Attorney as well. I originally had a much longer segment for this game, but it was filled with a bunch of jokes that took away from the game and ultimately didn't flow very well, so I'm just going to try and keep it brief this time. So to get the obvious elephant out of the room, yes, I did learn about this game through Hololive. No, I didn't just download it because Inugami Korone is a voice navigator in the game. I also got it for Jibanyan. I've been itching to play a mecha game since I tried the Demon X Machina demo back in 2019, and I soon learned that Megaton Musashi Cross was developed by Level 5 Games, so I knew it was going to at least be a confidently designed game, and I'm happy to say, I like it. The controls are smooth while still making your mech feel powerful, there's a ton of customization options, and the mix of hand-drawn 2D characters with 3D models is surprisingly nice to look at. The unfortunate downsides are that the combat can get repetitive after a while, and I, personally, don't understand Japanese, so this story could be actually garbage for all I know. But if you can make a Japanese account to download the game, I definitely recommend giving it a try. Especially if you dig giant robots as much as I do. When Nintendo announced an HD port of Ghost Trick Phantom Detective for the Switch, a bunch of my friends were jumping with excitement. Ghost Trick is an adventure-style puzzle game that's loved by many, myself... not included. Despite giving the game an honest shot, it just was not clicking with me. But that was also five years ago on an iPhone I remember losing my patience with at the time. Maybe it was time to revisit it? This time I opted to borrow my friend's DS copy, because the DS seemed to be part of what people enjoyed about this game, and also I was not about to break bank for something I wasn't sure I'd enjoy anyways. This game has a lot going for it, standout character designs, nice animations, plus a smooth and kitschy soundtrack. 
But for all the time I gave this game trying to finish it, I came to the same realization I did all those years ago. That realization? I'm bored. Despite my love for puzzles and mystery, there was something about Ghost Trick that was just not pulling me in. I even replayed some levels after I found myself skimming through the story, but I just cannot put my finger on it. There's just something about this game that makes me wish I was doing something else. I know that's not satisfying at all to hear, especially when somebody is talking about your favorite game. But if a game bored me despite me seeing what makes it so beloved, then what do you want me to say? Do you want me to make up a bunch of negatives? No, of course you don't, because you'd see from my lies immediately and I wouldn't gain anything from lying, so nobody wins there. Sometimes it's best to just accept that a game isn't for everyone and just... leave it at that. While recording footage from my Volume 2 list of my favorite first bosses, I made this bold claim. Well, I'm of the opinion that Dark Souls isn't actually that hard, yeah, that's real rich coming from somebody who's never finished the game. So I realized I have to put my money where my mouth is. I actually have to finish Dark Souls. For the record, I have played Dark Souls multiple times before. I just always get roadblocked by the Kappa Demon. I don't follow the Dark Souls community, so for all I know, that could be considered an easy boss, and I'm just a scrub. But once I finally beat my metaphorical white whale, I was surprised with how little problems I had with the rest of the game in comparison. I think part of that has to do with most bosses being fought in a large arena while the Capper Demon is fought in like a 2x4 square room. So it's not easy on the camera. There's also dogs that can stun you if you aren't wearing the proper armor. I was glad to see that my thoughts of the game were still valid after a full playthrough though. Here's your challenge. If you die, not a problem. Die twice though, that's your fault. Everything's a brick wall until you memorize those attacks and plan your actions thoroughly. Or maybe a tank is more accurate. You know what's funny? I remember people telling me that Dark Souls has this incredibly deep story to get invested in and... I mean, technically that's true. You're told the important stuff like what's happening and what you should be doing, but everything else is completely optional unless you're looking for it. And you know, I'm okay with that. I love environmental storytelling. Have I mentioned my love for Fallout yet? <laughs> but I can totally understand why an average RPG fan would be turned away by these sudden, uh, plot droughts, for lack of a better term. On the topic of environments, every location has this bleak, colorless feel to it, which works surprisingly well. Though I think the lack of music also helps with that. Like, seriously, I probably have Firelink Shrine on loop here because that's the only song in the game that doesn't go so hard on the string instruments. I played the original Xbox 360 version of the game because, well, I mean, I already have it and I have achievements to unlock, but I also didn't want to deal with online invasions. Not yet, anyway. See, part of what gave Dark Souls its infamous difficulty reputation is its brutal PvP system. As long as you have an internet connection and have cured your hollow state, other players can invade your game and try to kill you, and with no control over who invades you, it could be a veteran player or an unapologetic hacker. But reversing your hollow state comes with benefits like kindling bonfires to carry more healing items, so it's a very big risk versus reward system. Well, you know, unless you kiss my ass, Dark Souls. And oh my god, the boss fights talk about making somebody feel powerful. I've already talked about the Asylum Demon in detail in my previous video, but there's also the Bell Tower Gargoyles, this dragon whose tail I punched off, and god, I'm dreading my fight with the Four Kings in my fist-only run because yes, I'm doing a fist-only run. Confidence or masochism, you decide. If you haven't played Dark Souls yet, just play it. Don't worry about its reputation as an Omega hard game. Just take your time, play as you want to, and I think you'll enjoy it so much more. And hey, I won't judge you if you use a walkthrough. Before we had games like Ukulele to disappoint people with the term spiritual successor, we had I Am Setsuna. Or at least that's what I would have said before doing my research. I have a vague memory of everybody claiming that I Am Setsuna was the official spiritual successor to Chrono Trigger, but I couldn't find any claims like that from the developers. 
Yeah, they were very open about Chrono Trigger being the big inspiration for the game, but the term spiritual successor was never used from what I could tell. The only thing even close I could find was the Something Old, Something New trailer that didn't even mention Chrono Trigger outside of its description on YouTube. And no one reads the video description, am I right? Here you play as a masked mercenary who's been hired to assassinate a woman named Setsune. SHE IS SETSUNE! But after learning that Setsune is set to be the next sacrifice to appease the demon infesting the world with monsters, the mercenary decides to help her on her pilgrimage since, well, hey, if she's gonna die either way, may as well do it in a way that benefits everyone, right? Now maybe it's just because of where I grew up, but I love this game's setting. It's set in one big snowbound island where they could have easily screwed up and just made everything a blinding white hellscape, but no, I was happy to see that they actually did their research for snow-covered areas. There's blanketed evergreen forests, we've got blackout blizzards, whiteout blizzards, we get a scene where the party needs to find a guide to cross the ice because looks are deceiving and the frozen river actually has a very strong current, and oh look at that! They have the orange glow of light sources reflecting off the snow that I love oh so much. If I gave numerical scores, I'd give the presentation a 10 out of 10, I don't care how biased I sound, this shit is beautiful. Now the gameplay... well, it's Chrono Trigger. It's the main inspiration after all, so the combat is a copy of its active time battle system, but with a few of its own unique quirks. With the most obvious addition being the momentum system, where you can use your momentum with a time button press for an added effect on whatever skill you're using, such as attacking all enemies or landing a guaranteed critical hit. Or in some of the more broken cases, restoring HP and MP to all party members. Speaking of skills, techs are a thing. Yeah, they just straight up took their name from Chrono Trigger. But instead of learning them by level up, you have to trade for them by selling specific items at the shop. And in an even weirder decision, they made some of these materials only drop by enemies if you kill them in a very specific way. For example, this bear enemy will always drop the shiny fur, but if you kill them with time magic, you'll also gain the fan maple root. They'll also drop a beehive if you get an exact kill on them. Wait, an exact kill? Oh no. Yes, there are some items you can only obtain after defeating an enemy by dealing the exact number of damage equal to their max HP, which is much easier said than done in an RPG where your stats are constantly changing! And this isn't the only decision that sounds good on paper but comes off as arguably bad in execution. Towns are a safe zone, but you can't save your progress in towns. You also can't heal in towns because there's no inns, meaning you have to buy a tent so you can leave town to heal your party. Now that doesn't sound bad at first, but it can lead to a lot of frustrating moments. Here's an example, uh, well, actually it's not a real example, it's a scenario I've made up so I can talk about this while avoiding spoilers. Okay, so there's a scene where one of your teammates has been poisoned, but it's a poison with a rare antidote, so you have to find a cure. And after asking around town for a while, you learn that the mayor keeps a rare medicine with them for emergencies, so you ask him if you can have it to save your friend, and he says, Oh yeah, sure, but first I have to make sure my precious medicine isn't going to waste. He attacks, I die, game over. The problem here is that the game never gave me a reason to leave town, and because you can't save your game while in town, I lost a ton of progress in an area I never left to save or heal in because I was conditioned to believe that I was in a safe zone. And this isn't the only time they do this either. Wanna hear some more weird decisions? The Dispel skill, which traditionally only removes positive effects on an enemy, can also deal damage, and I don't know how I feel about this one. Because on one hand, you can debuff an enemy without skipping a turn of damage, but on the other hand... It can deal so much damage it feels like an easy button. I haven't even mentioned the fluxation system, and I honestly don't want to. It's not hard to understand, but it's complex enough that if I try to explain, I'd probably add another 8 minutes to this video. Okay. Now, I really need to talk about this because the Chrono Trigger inspiration, which I put in massive air quotes, becomes all the more blatant when you look at the names of the characters' techs. The first tech you learn is Cyclone. There's also Cleave, Omega Flare, Delta Flare, Luminary, Antipode Blast. Hmm, I wonder where they came up with that idea. 
Still think I'm grasping at straws? <laughs> well, I've been saving this one. The very first combo tech you learn in the game is a double tech called Cross Strike. A combination attack performed by your red-headed, katana-wielding silent protagonist and the girl who dresses like a frog. Somebody skipped the art of subtlety in their writing class. And you know what the worst part is? If you ignore all the blatant Chrono Trigger inspiration, you get a legitimately somber and inspiring story about living your life to its fullest, no matter what destiny may have in store for you, and how at the end of the day your choices do matter. Just ignore the fact that most choices made in game don't actually matter. This is a game, not real life. You know what I think I Am Setsuna's biggest problem is? It's the fact that they mention Chrono Trigger right there in the store page. Sure, it's not directly calling it a spiritual successor or anything like that, but by pointing out the game's inspiration, you've opened it up to comparison. Comparison to a game that many people have nostalgia for because it came out over 20 years ago and is still considered one of the greatest games ever made. Of course the hype was going to die down the moment Chrono Trigger was mentioned, because you keep making these callbacks to Chrono Trigger, despite the story having nothing to do with Chrono Trigger. If they wanted to make an original RPG to replicate the golden era with a somber story that had me thinking about my own life and eventual death, well, they certainly did that. But if they wanted to make a game that captured the original spirit of Chrono Trigger, I don't think they did a very good job. I really hope the team at Tokyo RPG Factory learned of their strengths for their newest titles. So, the original version of Doom was released 30 years ago. A revolutionary game not just for first-person shooters, but for gaming in general. And despite its reputation for being able to run on practically everything, I've never played Doom in my life. And I think it's about time to fix that. I've had it downloaded on my 360 for years now, so I have no excuse not to play it at this point. Alright, uh, let's do Ultraviolets. I beat blood on well done. I feel I could take on anything at this point. Wait. This doesn't feel right. Screw it, we're going for the most authentic experience as possible. Alright, now let's see if I can remember the old dusk mans. Alright, let's see, mount the directory. So far, so good. Now let's change directory to Doom. Bingo! Uh, run doom.exe. Okay, mouse to aim. Oh, no, mouse to move. Okay, I think I can get the hang of it. Oh, no, nope, Doom Guy. Doom Guy, you're dying. Get out of the. Get out of the. Okay, maybe we don't need to go completely authentic. So it turns out that Doom was programmed to work with both a keyboard and or mouse, so it's a bit disorienting for those that are used to more modern FPSs. I opted to use just the keyboard while using the mouse to help me turn during more high action fights. I don't think that's even remotely how the developers intended it, but that's what was most comfortable for me. That footage of me booting up the DOS version, by the way, that wasn't just a bit. I actually downloaded the original shareware version alongside the original retail version. Couldn't get the music working, unfortunately. Don't know if that was the version I downloaded or something wrong with my DOS box, but my first playthrough went without the amazing MIDI soundtrack by Bobby Prince, which should be a crime. And yes, I did purchase the game by more legitimate means soon after, because, well, what can I say, I like to give support to the things I love, and this may or may not surprise you to hear, but I loved playing Doom. The fast-paced action, the arsenal of simple but effective weapons, the secrets and enemy ambushes that weren't afraid to laugh in your face after kicking you in the balls. And that's the thing, I have no prior attachment to this game, and I still wanted to keep playing. I even ordered a pepperoni pizza to eat while fighting the final boss. In that brief moment, I was a 90s kid again. Can't say I'm enough of a PC gamer that I feel like going out to learn the difference between Zed Doom or GZ Doom or even try any mods, really. But I'm definitely going to check out the sequel in the very near future. Partly because I've heard it described as bigger and better Doom, but mostly because I want to know why everybody gets a massive boner at the mere mention of the super shotgun. 
Guess I'll find out soon enough. Hey, you! <laughs> Sorry, I just really love that bit. I was surprised when I learned I never actually played this before. It just seemed like something I would have gotten to much sooner considering my love for Super Nintendo platformers. But the important thing is, I played Donkey Kong Country this year, and it was just as great as everyone says it is. I think part of the reason it took so long to get to this was because I was intimidated by its length, and then I completed it 101% in only 5 hours. In my defense though, my first DK game was Donkey Kong 64, so there's probably some childhood trauma in there somewhere. I honestly believed everybody was just over-exaggerating how useless Donkey Kong was in this game. Until I experienced the full power of Diddy Kong! He's much more nimble, holds barrels in front of him for arguably better protection and more precise aim, while also using Donkey Kong as a meat shield. I'm sorry, but I just didn't find Donkey Kong's ability to stomp larger enemies all that useful, especially if Rambi was hiding in the stage, and his little ground slap that he does, I didn't even know was in the game until I started writing the script. This game was one of the first to use 3D animation, and also came out three years before Blood, so what's your excuse, Caleb? <laughs> No, but seriously, this was really impressive for its time, especially with how expressive the cons are throughout the game. Of course, the soundtrack by David Wise and Evelyn Novakovic, nay Fisher, is great too. I mean, it's got tunes I've often hum along to despite never playing the game before. I also thought the use of pre-rendered backgrounds was done wonderfully well, as I'd often find myself giving it one last look before approaching the level exit. I especially loved the mountains and gorilla glaciers that would disappear as the mountain transitioned into a blizzard. I can see why so many people enjoy Donkey Kong Country so much, and I'd be willing to call it the perfect platformer if it wasn't for a few hiccups I had with it. Didn't really like Blackout Basement. Not because it was hard or anything, I just found the flickering effect really annoying. Almost as much as Squawk's Lantern, in fact. Donkey Kong doesn't feel very useful, as I've mentioned earlier, and I really didn't like collecting the animal friend tokens. Like, yeah, they're great for one-ups, and I love my animal buddies, but you grab the last one outside of a bonus room, and it pulls you out of the level only to spit you back out at the last checkpoint you reached. You can lose a lot of progress, and I found it way easier to just avoid them and get one-ups another way. But I'm definitely willing to add up there with all the other 2D platformers I love so much from the good old days, where people didn't ask why crocodiles would steal an ape's bananas. I'm not better now that I have a nephew who's getting into video games, I don't know what you're talking about. So I was browsing the Xbox store one day when I saw this. Wait a minute, Terra Online? Isn't that that MMO that shut down a while ago? Come on, Microsoft, surely you have better quality control than that. I mean, why would you keep a game on your storefront that doesn't even... Oh, wait, actually, it's still working. I can actually play this. Well, all right, let's play Terra. I mean, I did download it primarily as a point-and-laugh moment at Microsoft, but I am genuinely interested in this game. Terra Online got its overseas release back in May of 2012, so it's likely you've at least heard of it back when it was still making the rounds. An action MMO with real-time combat and amazing graphics, which now that I say that out loud sounds like every MMO marketing... F frickin' thing. <laughs> okay, so while making your character, you might notice that several classes are gender-locked. Why play as a Valkyrie? Well, only females can. How about a gunner? Tough luck, you're stuck as a female. I wouldn't mind this if, for one, this was for some kind of world-building, but as far as I'm aware, there's nothing like that. And two you weren't an MMO. Because as an MMO, you want players to socialize, and freedom of expression is very important for that. I'm not saying women can't kick ass, I'm saying everybody should have the choice to be equally as badass. Ah, uh, but don't worry guys, the alien can play as any class you'd like. In fact, there are some classes exclusively for them, so there's clearly some kind of favoritism here. Which I don't want to think too hard about, considering they're an all-female race that stops physically aging past 11. You know what, I'm gonna go against the norm. I'm gonna play as this short and round panda race. Maybe I can recreate Ricky from Xenoblade. Okay, first problem. The game was clearly not optimized for the Xbox One. There is so much texture pop-up, it's not funny. And I don't mean like a tree 10 yards in the distance pop-up. 
There are times I have to wait for the text backdrop to finish loading up so I can read what the quest giver is trying to tell me. I've even seen the game resolution drop during cutscenes, it's so jarring. Not only that, but the subtitles are so far behind the actual audio, like this is no joke. Everyone is asking me about what you did on the Island of Dawn. Don't get cocky. Impressive to them, but it takes more than that to impress me. And I have little tolerance for glory hounds like you. Kids these days, no sense of proportion. <laughs> this board sounding man is voiced by Michael Hogan, by the way, probably best known in the gaming community for his voice as Captain Bailey in Mass Effect, General Tullius in Skyrim, and Doc Mitchell in Fallout New Vegas, which tells me they probably promised him a fat paycheck and gave him no direction whatsoever. Combat is super flashy and it can be fun, but I guarantee you that 99% of my footage is just going to be me doing the basic attacks because Terra wants to make sure you never feel insignificant. The game rewards you with weapons and armor several times more powerful than your current equipment after every other quest. If you equip the items you get from following the main quest, you will never be at a point where you can't defeat basic enemies in one hit. I compare it to Musou games, but that still feels wrong because even Dynasty Warriors has tougher enemies sprinkled throughout the armies of paper peons. Terra Online is a power fantasy without the adventure that would get you that strong in the first place. It's a hero's journey without the journey. Imagine if you were playing Symphony of the Night and Death never came to take Alucard's weapons. Or if you started A Link to the Past with the Master Sword, and the Bombos Medallion, and unlimited magic meter, there'd be no challenge, you'd find that boring! And that's kind of the issue of Terra. Out of curiosity, I went into a group dungeon by myself, and despite the back-to-back -back boss fights that gave me no time to heal or rest, I didn't die once. I came close, I did have to use some of my potions, but in the end, I actually ended the dungeon with more potions than when I entered. Terra Online is not a long-form game. It is a game where you play an unstoppable force and look good while doing it. It's even more style over substance than Devil May Cry and Bayonetta combined. And if that's what you're into, cool, I won't stop you. Especially not nowadays when we don't really know how long we have until the console versions shut down. But if you actually like to overcome challenges to become a hero, you're better off looking somewhere else. As mentioned earlier, I became sick with COVID at the tail end of the year. Does YouTube still have a problem with people saying COVID? But it was especially miserable for me because my back problems started to flare up again and I couldn't find the energy to do my exercises necessary to treat it, so I needed something to take my mind off the pain. I tried playing Populous, only to be met with the most bare-bones gaming experience yet. Tried playing the Steam version of the Final Fantasy Free Remake, only to learn that the quality of life improvements I heard of are only for accessing the post-game content, so my opinion on the game hasn't really changed. Then I found another game that caught my attention, Dimension Tripper Neptune Top Nip. Which took me about 20 minutes to finish, since it's just a Space Harrier clone with a Neptunia skin. But it has less weight to it, you can't run on the ground like in Space Harrier, so there's never any change in gameplay or feel. You can collect coins to temporarily gain a wingman for extra firepower, but... Okay, this next critique may sound odd at first, but bear with me. Each wingman is on a rotation, and that rotation starts at a random spot for each playthrough. But if you get the twin characters Rom and Ram, you basically win the stage because it's effectively two wingmen for the price of one. So you could easily just keep resetting until you get someone earlier in the list, effectively manipulating the list so that you can save Ram and Ram for the later stages. I wasn't even trying this and I beat the final boss. Just like that. Thank god this only cost me five bucks. Right, so I managed to kill 20 minutes after falling ill. Now, my math may not be the best, but that doesn't count for even a fraction of the time I was confined to bed rest. Luckily, I did remember a game that many people play to pass the time while they're sick. You know what's more fun than playing with toys? Huh? Setting them on fire! With your new Little Inferno Entertainment Fireplace! Yeah! It's Little Inferno! 
Little Inferno is a game where you buy things to burn in your fireplace. That's pretty much all you're doing. The game literally starts with you burning the terms and conditions of your new fireplace. TLDR, burn it all. You can burn corn on the cob, your dad's credit card, used batteries, creepy old toys, letters from your neighbor, hell, throw some old computer parts in there. What's the worst that can happen? Warning, do not attempt at home, never play with fire outside your little inferno fireplace. Believe it or not, there's a story in this game, and it's one that I am not gonna talk about because I want everyone to experience this for themselves. I'm not joking, it goes places, dude. I was so caught off guard, I honestly expected Murdoch fucking Nichols to appear and reveal that this was a gorilla's promotion the whole time. And I'm totally not just saying that because of how satisfying it was to play this game with the Plastic Beach album playing in the background. Sounds good. Both my playthroughs took just under four hours each to finish, and I'd say it was a day well spent. Oh, why did I do two playthroughs in one day? Well, I bought the Holiday DLC since it was just a few days before Christmas when I played. That said though, don't play the DLC right after the main game. It's just a few extra items and a slightly different story. Just use it for your second playthrough instead. There we go, those are the games I played in 2023, and judging from the word count on this script, this might be my longest video yet. I also realized that starting with the backlog games mixed up the ratings much more than usual, so if that's something you care about, here's a little tier list for reference. I might try to work on something like this for future videos, but we'll see. Now for this year's backlog game challenge, I'm still only going to pick five games. Why? Because I have two jobs now, so I'll have to see how that affects my free time before I can make any confident changes. I know, it's not very exciting when I'm not working on a huge list to challenge myself with, but the important thing is that I'm trying new things, and I'm actually finishing games in my backlog. At least I finished my goal, haha, <laughs> suck it, try! But this year I'm also going to add one game I want to replay. I'll explain why when we get there, but first, here are the five backlog games I hope to complete by the end of 2024. Demon Souls. Psychonauts 2. Jet Set Radio! Baldur's Gate. And lastly, The Curse of Monkey Island. Last year I also issued a challenge for my viewers to finish a specific game by the end of 2023. If you remember that video, you'll have to tell me if you completed that challenge. This year, however, I'm going to issue two games for you to complete, since the first one can be done in less than a day. First, I'm going to tell you to go play Little Inferno, because I legitimately had fun with that game, and I want to see more people talking about it. The next one is for all you Nintendo fans out there. Now, be honest with yourselves. When was the last time you did a proper playthrough of Orcarina of Time? Maybe it's because of its age, maybe it's because bigger and better games have come out since, but Ocarina of Time has become such a diverse game over the years that I kinda want to hear people talk about it again. Whether it's new players, or you're returning to it after several years, or you're someone who plays it religiously, I want you to play Ocarina of Time and let me know your thoughts from your most recent playthrough. Now, for my 2024 replay. Final Fantasy VI has been my gold standard for RPGs for almost a decade at this point, and yet I haven't played the game since high school, so I think it's high time for another playthrough. I'll be playing the advanced version, since that's the one I feel to be the superior version, but I'll also see if I can find time to play the original Super Nintendo release for a comparison. Something tells me that the challenge of this year is going to be finding a way to talk about multiple RPGs in one video with a much more fluid script. But after realizing how rusty I've gotten, I definitely welcome that challenge. I hope to see you all again next year, and if things go well, 
maybe sooner. And as always, take it easy and stay positive. <laughs>